to Subtext and Discourse, a podcast which takes you behind the scenes of the art world with the unique individuals involved in the field. I'm your host, Michael Dooney, co-founder and director of independent contemporary art space, Jarvis Dooney. Well, another two weeks of COVID-19 and more confusion when it comes to the rules and regulations. My next guest and I were hoping to record our interview in person, however, due to the coronavirus, she's still working remotely from the US. So we thought rather than wait, we've opted to try this out online. Peggy Sue Emerson is the director of East Wing, a platform for photography founded in Doha, Qatar. Prior to that, she was the artistic director of Sirius Art Centre in Ireland, a multidisciplinary visual art centre and residency program. As a curator, writer, strategist, mentor, and photographic consultant, Peggy is one of the hardest working people in the industry and a regular contributor to photography festivals in Europe and North America. We learn about how she went from living in San Francisco to Cove in Ireland, from producing her own photographic work to supporting artists in her role of artistic director of a non for profit institute, as well as the resilience needed to be an artist which may just be the attribute we need to get through this unusual time. Just a quick reminder to please subscribe and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And I hope you enjoy my conversation with Peggy Sue Amerson. And I didn't know you were in San Diego, actually. I'm really sorry. I always thought you were from San Francisco. Well, no, I mean, because I spent most of my adult life in San Francisco. I mean, I moved there when I was 20 and I moved to Ireland when I was 38. So that feels more like hometown. This is where my family is. But that's really where I feel like I grew up and started to become a human being. Because here I was, when I left here, I didn't know, I didn't know anything when I left here. Yeah, my geography of the US isn't very good. And I looked up San Diego and I thought, you're closer to LA than you are to San Francisco. Yeah, and I don't I don't like LA. I mean, I, I much prefer Northern California to Southern California. But I mean, I'm not complaining. I have sun. It's good. My brother has a nice place for me to stay. He's being very gracious. I mean, to put up a house guest for over seven weeks now, that's that's a big ask. So he's been really, really, really great. Yeah. Well, I knew you were going over to the US anyway, because you were there for PhotoFest Houston, is it? Yeah. Yeah. I came up for PhotoFest and then I was going to do some research while I was here. Because I saw Krista Svalbornas, she shared her 10 by 10 that she was shown there. And I think Laura Noble showed it because she's representing her now. But then when I saw who, re- who nominated her, I thought, oh, you actually already know her. So have you been going to Houston for a while now? Oh, yeah, no, I've been going to Houston. I mean, I've been doing photo festivals since I think it started in 2005 because Cork was capital of culture. And I had done a project with Simon Norfolk and the Irish Army, which was called Welcome to the Hotel Africa. And at that time, I saw that when we showed photography, our audience changed. And this is a small town, 20 minutes from Cork City. There was a gallery of photography and there was Belfast Exposed. But other than that, there was no other galleries that were really doing much with photography at that time. Off and on. And so I tried to bring it into our curriculum. We had the residency program, so I was able to bring artists to the residency as well as exhibit their work. And so I went to 2005 when they were looking for suggestions and I suggested Simon. I guess he made the work in 2004 because we showed it in 2005 and he went to uh, Kosovo in Liberia and worked with the Irish army. So at that point in time, then I was like, well, maybe we should do a photo festival in Cork. And I went to Wuj because they had this thing called Festival of Light. It was a meeting where they were trying to bring all these photo festivals together in Europe. And I just wanted to go and do some research. And that's how I met Krzysztof Sandrowicz and the Wuj Photo Festival. Through them, the first portfolio review I did was in Bratislava around that time. And that's where I met April. Oh, really? I met April there. I met Charlie Juve there. I met Dowie Lewis there. I met Jim Casper. I mean, all of my main colleagues... I met them all then. And then I started getting invited because I was in Ireland. People were curious about what was going on in Ireland and they wanted to know more about what we were doing. So I traveled quite a lot when I, I mean, I went to a lot of festivals during that time and also established a lot of partnerships because that was really important running a nonprofit. I needed to constantly find partnerships to be able to bring work to us, but also to make a mark. We had a beautiful building. The building was over 150 years old. It was the first yacht club in the world. We had a residency program. We were multidisciplinary. I ran concerts. We had installation works. We did outreach. We did so much there that it it was really important to find a niche for us so that we wouldn't lose funding. So photography became my niche. I mean, we were still showing everything. We showed painting, drawing, installation performance 
performance the whole nine yards, as well as music and doing the outreach. But we had this strong photography program, which helped us maintain our funding yeah. at a time when the Celtic Tiger, you know, the crash happened in Ireland. Uh, and, yes, of course. And the thing is, people are very curious about Ireland. So I was able to bring artists there. I mean, I showed August Sanders' work. We showed Imogen Cunningham. Doug Dubois came out from America. He'd never really done a residency the way we did residencies. So I met him at PhotoFest Houston. It must have been 2008. And from 2009 to 2014, he came back every summer for six to eight weeks to work on the project that he started in one of the housing estates. You know, I think I met him, I can't remember if it was 2009 or 10, but it was around the time that he was doing that project because I did a portraiture workshop in Berlin and he showed us some of the work. Yeah, and that's another thing I used to do to try to get artists to come because I didn't have a lot of money. So what I would do is say, you know, can you talk to your university or your arts council about flying you out i can give you accommodation this is the fee i can give you which was very small and then i would contact friends and say you know do you want this person to come over they're going to be here do you want to fly them over to berlin and do a workshop and that's how that workshop happened but i would do that all the time try to find other ways to entice artists to stay because i didn't have a lot of money yeah and that's why i've always been kind of doing this networking thing when you run a nonprofit for 14 years you really have to figure out ways to barter yeah definitely how did you get started there then? Because you were, you said before you were in San Francisco and you did your studies there. Yeah, so I got my degree, a BA in art with an emphasis in photography from San Francisco State. And I worked all these different jobs after that, as you do when you have like a really valuable art degree nobody cares about. I mean, I was a receptionist, I worked in photo labs, I did anything I could. And then I was working on my own work on the side. What kind of work were you doing? I was a photographer, so I was working mostly in black and white, mostly portraiture. I studied a lot of traditional processes like gum printing, brown printing, things like that when I was in college. But I couldn't really sustain that when I got out because I didn't have a space where I could use that kind of chemistry. So I was doing all these pay the bills jobs. And then on the weekend, I would go and print all weekend or I would go and shoot all weekend. Then I would go back to my nine to five. I was writing subscription marketing letters for advertorial magazines. That was my job. I was 38 years old and I thought, I'm struggling. I mean, San Francisco was not as expensive as it, as it is now. It was expensive, but it was not as expensive as it is now. That was the 90s though, wasn't it? Was the dot-com thing happening? Yeah, I left in 2000. The dot-com boom happened. A lot of the galleries were getting pushed out of South of Market. Um, and that's where the dot-com industries were moving in. You know, some people made a lot of money really fast. Uh, I just was struggling. I mean, I was getting by, but it was it was tough. And I was at that age where people were getting married and leaving. And, and I was also living in the mission and it was kind of dangerous. It wasn't really bad but uh, there was a lot of shootings. There were a lot of gang wars. It was kind of a moment of like, what do you want your life to be? I could stay at these jobs and I would keep getting incremental raises and I'm sure I would have been fine, but I was really unhappy. I love San Francisco. I hated leaving, but at the same time, I thought I have to do something really drastic. So I decided to move to Ireland through some very funny happenstance. I met a lot of Irish authors. There were this series of readings going on. So I was helping them just to get out of the house and do something. And so I started making connections in Ireland. Nula Fuelan helped me. Another guy, um, Eddie Stack, helped me to just go over and check it out. So I went over and I, I traveled around. I ended up working in a restaurant washing dishes in the west of Ireland, a place called Doolin, really small town, two streets and three pubs and a bunch of B&Bs and that was it. I was only supposed to stay for two months that time. I was just going to kind of check, but I quit my job at the Avatorial and I just said, okay, I can't, I don't want to do this anymore. Oh, in the US. Yeah. And I went to Ireland and I was only supposed to stay two months and I stayed five because I liked it a lot. And I really enjoyed being in Doolin. And then I came back and said, okay, if I find a job in six weeks, then I'll stay six months and then I'll pack it up and I'll go to Ireland. And um, I did. I found another job working for another Avatorial magazine. I worked there six months and then I went to Ireland and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I ended up going back to the restaurant that I worked in in Doolin and I worked there for the summer and I ran a hostel there for the first part of the winter. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I just thought I have to do something. I mean, I need to be making my work or I need to be involved in the arts in some ways. And so I applied for a residency at Sirius for a residency and an exhibition and I got both of them. Oh, cool. And so I went for two months. It was like January, February and my show opened just before I remember International Women's Day because I had to do a talk for International Women's Day and it was all work that pretty much the work that I had made, all black and white work that I had made in um, in Ireland was some work I had brought with me. The day before the exhibition went up, I had been kind of nosing around there because I really liked the center and um, I liked the people I was meeting. And 
And I liked the idea of being a part of an organization that had a residency program and exhibitions and was doing all these other things. And so I was just saying like, you know, any chance of any work around here? And of course there wasn't going to be any because most art centers in Ireland are run on what they call FOSS schemes, which are work placement schemes. So you usually have paid staff. And then at least at that time, you would have a lot of FOSS staff. So it would be people who'd been out of work for a really long time who were working in the art center to gain skills. And that way the art center could have a staff without having to pay them. The government was paying them. So they would get a little bit more than the dole. Yeah. So the chances of me being able to do that were zero. But then the day before the exhibition opened, this was one of those moments where you're like, okay, I guess I'm on the right track. The director came to me who was American and said, I've decided to take a job in Galway running the children's festival. We need somebody to run this place immediately. Can you t- do this for three months? Oh gosh. And I said, yes, of course I said yes, because <laughs> I didn't want to go back to washing dishes. And I ran it for 14 years. Wow. I wasn't supposed to stay there for more than three months. I had to actually reapply for my job at one point, which was kind of that would have been scary, yeah. crazy. It was supposed to be a part-time position. It was never a part-time position, you know, but I loved it so much. I just put everything into it. And after 14 years, I was really tired. But while I was there, I really focused on photography and I was able to bring people like Robert and Shanna Park Harrison were in the residency. Alexei Tentarenko came to the residency, you know, the big project with Doug. And then to be able to bring, you know, shows like Imogene Cunningham to this tiny art center, that was huge, yeah, you know, incredible. but that was all through my contacts, you know, uh, Selena Lunsford was working for the Imogene Cunningham Trust and I was able to go to her and she was showing me this work and I said, would you want to bring that to Ireland? And she was like, yes, yeah. because I, I don't think Imogene Cunningham's ever had a show in Ireland. So we were able to bring that work. But I think the thing that was really fortunate for me at that time was that there were no photo festivals in Ireland. Now there's two. Yeah. People are showing much more photography now because of the way digital has grown. There's more study programs in Ireland for photography. But when I was there, there was none of that. Yeah, because if you say it was 2000 or 2001 that you started at the centre, uh-huh. that was the period that digital was kind of making a present. Exactly. I think I remember in Perth, because we used to always go to the graduate exhibitions at the table which was the technical college for photography. And I think I remember the point when more of the work that was produced was digital than analog, just through the processes they were using. You could see less of the dark room and less of the photographer's physical hands in the work. You were seeing the switch over and that would have been maybe like 2004, 2005. But then that would have been happening whilst you were at the centre, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Sirius was formed by a group of, it was a voluntary board. So Peter Murray was one of the first people, He's he was the director of the Crawford Art gallery until just recently he retired. But he and his wife decided that they were going to turn this into an art center at a time where there was more grants. So they brought some terrific people there. I mean, they brought Patrick Ireland, did some installation, which they just recovered last year and did a whole year, two years of programming. But I mean, he brought some amazing names and a lot of those artists, they would have been renowned in the world, but they wouldn't have been known in Ireland. So it was a really interesting time. When I go back and look at some of the artists that were in residence, it's kind of amazing that I got to work with some amazing sound artists. But in terms of photography, there was a need for development. So my whole point was in running that center was we would have shows that would really directly connect to the local community. So like we had an exhibition of textiles or we would do an outreach program. And then we would have these bigger names of artists coming in and doing these crazy installations, which would leave the locals going, what the hell? You know, but then people from Cork would come down. Uh, And then with photography, what I was trying to do was to show that it's a valuable art form, first of all. I mean, when I showed my work there, I remember somebody saying to me, like, my, my prints were cheap, right? And somebody came to me and said... Sure, why would I ever buy one of those when I can when you can go down to the chemist and get another one for a fiver? <laughs> you know, that was the idea. Yeah. That it's you can replicate it very easily and very cheaply. The general public wouldn't understand and still don't understand that it's really an art form and it's really hard work and you 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 know, everything is a tool and you really think it through when you're working on it. So that's a lot of what we were doing. And I would try to bring in, like if I had an artist, I would try to connect them with the college or I would try to do a workshop in the art center so that I could get them some money, but also so that we could educate people who were interested. You know, Doug did workshops. Roger Ballon did a workshop up in Belfast. But it was also trying to get people to work together. Like I would call the gallery of photography and say, okay, these are the people that I'm bringing this year. Are you interested in any of them? So they actually took Robert and Shana's work from Sirius to Dublin and showed it in Dublin. So I was always trying to connect with people or I I would have an artist in residence. Like I worked with Gilles Perrin, who was making work about the fishing community in Cork. So I called West Cork. There was an art center there. And I said, you know, do you want them to come there? They're doing stuff for me. So do you want them to come and work?
work with you and maybe we can make this a bigger project. So I was always trying to find ways to create documents of importance for the local area, you know, and for Ireland. Having Doug do that work about the young people living in a housing estate in Cove, yeah. who would normally, nobody would know anything about them. But to do that and see that it's such a universal story, young people trying to establish themselves at a time where you're up against drugs, you're up against families breaking up. Unemployment. Yeah, unemployment. So trying to show the broader scope, but then also bringing some artists where it was just like, this is a really important photographer and we need to show them. So doing things like Absence of Subject, which was Michael Somroff and August Sander, to be able to bring August Sander's work. Yeah, that's amazing. To, that was my last show at Sirius. And I was just, it was really beautiful to, you know, to be able to bring Richard Moss's work, like those enormous pieces to Cove, but be working with uh, Liverpool and we were working with Paris to do that tour and to bring that to that tiny little art center. It really put us on the map. Yeah, absolutely. I felt very fortunate that I was able to contribute to the development of photography in Ireland. When I was asked to be on the board of Belfast, and I really felt I was on uh, the board of Belfast Photo Festival. You know, I'd always never shied away from going to the north. Um, I had a car so I could drive there. It would take 12 hours, but I would drive up there. And I worked with Dindary a little bit when I first came to Ireland. But later when Michael asked me to be on the board. Uh, I, I mean, I was really involved. I had a lot of long conversations with him on the phone about how to develop activities because I've been doing it for so long. And like, don't do this, do that. You know, like, look out for this. You, you know, you want to be careful about that. I had a lot of experience with so many parts of exhibitions and what to look out for. How is it then when you very first started out though at Cirrus? It sounds as though you were working essentially as an artist and a photographer producing your own work and then somebody said I'm leaving would you like to run this place and then that was it. You were directing a, an institute all of a sudden. Yeah and then I became an artistic director and less of an artist. I think I had one more show after that I took that job and then I just couldn't maintain my practice anymore. Sometimes I feel that makes me I think I can ask the right questions of artists when I'm working with them because I've been on both sides of the table. You know, I mean, I've, Absolutely, yeah. I've worked for nonprofits. I've worked for commercial galleries. I've worked in art fairs. I've been to photo festivals. Personally, I feel like I know how to use different venues and different possibilities to develop work. And again, things you need to look out for, like getting things in writing up front. Like I made that mistake of not being clear on certain things early on in my career. And I, I learned really quickly that can get you a lot of trouble. Yeah. I mean, I took a whole bunch of artists work to China and had a show in China. I had kind of a, a lot of a lot of stories, you know, that I could share with artists. And even now, I mean, I think the strong point of me as a curator or having me as an advisor is that I ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I don't dictate to the artists. It's more like I help them find it. I help them find what is the hook or where's the weakness. It's those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, when I first came to Ireland and I first started running Sirius, I had no idea what I was doing, Yeah, honestly. I mean, I learned everything by the seat of my pants. I didn't know how to write. I didn't know how to do budgeting. I didn't know any of that. I didn't know how to write a grant. I mean, I remember asking my sister, because my sister works for San Diego State University in the foundation department, saying, how do you write a grant? Like, I had no idea. And at that point in time in Ireland, you know, nobody cared. They just wanted to just run that. Just, just take care of that place over there now. You know, you'll be grand. <laughs> it's much different now. I mean, it's way different now. Like now, I don't think I would have gotten that job. I would, it would have been a much more rigorous process to be given that job. You essentially carved out a sought after role. So now the place is desirable for other people who ordinarily be like, why am I going to Cove? Yeah, exactly. We really, I mean, and I have to also credit the board with that. We had a, a visual arts committee because I didn't want the, the decision to be solely mine on who got residencies and who got exhibitions. So I made sure that we had a panel that met, we went through every application and we made sure that it was even across the board. So there was community art. That's not the word to use anymore, but it was like an outreach kind of art, celebrating local artists and local people. And then we also had like sound installations that where we would have to have a certain part of that program be educational because people would understand why, what's a sound installation, you know? Well, especially if you're not in a capital city and you're not capturing or you don't have the contemporary art audience that are going to flock to that kind of thing, you do need to engage with the man on the street or whatever the saying is who doesn't normally think oh I'm going to go to the museum today it's just there's an event on the community gallery it was in the newspaper I'm going to go see what it is education and creating awareness is kind of at the top it's one of the main things that you really need to be thinking about when you're planning these kind of shows yeah and also the building was challenging because at one point in time it was a yacht club and you weren't even allowed to walk on the steps unless you were a member women had to go in the side entrance there was a huge history that had not been forgotten with that building and so getting people in 
in. I mean, that's why we did the concerts because I felt like, okay, we'll bring trad concerts in. We had this very small venue that could seat 80 people. A trad concert? Like traditional music. Ah, okay. Yep. We bring in traditional music. You know, so we always had to be very careful about when we did concerts. Could we bring in a show that was going to sell out? Like we had Damien Rice play there or we had some very famous traditional music musicians play there. And we really have to think about what's on the walls when we do this concert. Do we need to take things down and then set it up for the next day? I mean, it was really a movable feast, what we did there. But I was grappling with a lot of issues. I was grappling with the fact that it had been a very elitist building for many years and not looked down upon, but people wouldn't go in there. It was quite formal, getting the audience, getting the locals to come in, making it their place, doing things like having to maintain the building. We had to underpin the whole building at one point because there was a vast void underneath the building because a ship had hit it in the 60s, had hit the front of the foundation and, you know, had been kind of fixed, but not really. And as the boats were going by, and these were big boats, like it was sucking the foundation out from under the building. Oh, really? You could see it. It was kind of tipping a little bit. <laughs> And so um, finally, we did a big fundraiser. We were able to underpin the building. We finally secured it in a way it had never been secured before. And I mean, we had people living in the basement, so we really didn't want the building to fall down. No. <laughs> um, it's, it's a really incredible space. I was really fortunate to be able to work there for as long as I did. Did you have any difficulties with certain work? Because you were saying that the yacht center or former yacht center itself, it was difficult for people just from a societal point of view to think, okay, can I go in there? Is it okay? But when you were showing certain projects, because Ireland is still in a lot of ways quite conservative where there's certain topics that you presented there that you had to think is this okay for us to show or do we need to maybe frame it in a different way well i think anytime you're running a venue or anytime you're preparing an exhibition you want to consider the audience so that's something that i always did you know if i thought something was going to be challenging then we would make sure there was a talk or something that if people really wanted to know, but sure, I got a lot of criticism. But overall, I think, you know, people were really happy about what we were doing. I mean, but every so often we would bring in an installation and people would just walk in and go, <laughs> and like walk out the door again, you know? It would really be that, that like they'd be that honest. They would just walk in, look at it and go, what the hell? And walk out the door, you know? But that would just be, you know, but then there would be other people who would come in and go, wow, this is incredible. This is so amazing. You know, or people would travel. Like I remember people traveled to come and see Richard Moss's exhibition. They would travel from up the country. And that was incredible when that would happen. But yeah, I mean, you you always have to consider your audience and what can they handle. And if they're not, if it's, you know, I don't want to say over their head because then that, that demeans the audience. But if it's not something they would understand, how do you, I mean, that was the whole point is how do you broaden, how do you raise the level of understanding about art and what art can be? Well, I think I remember when Doug was talking about showing his work and when he was showing it to the community in progress, I think I remember him saying, some people in the community kind of pushing back, saying, why are you taking photos of our kids? Why do you want to go around the community? Why are you doing what you're doing? Oh my God, in the beginning, it was crazy. In the beginning, like, okay, he's taking a four by five camera into a housing estate. Nobody knows him from Adam. He got stopped by the police at least three times going, what are you doing? I mean, mostly they were just like, what? what's that thing? You know, they were just really <laughs> curious about what's that giant box? Why are you putting that thing over your head when you take that picture? So I had to write a letter that he would carry with him that would verify, yes, he is an artist in residence working with us. I mean, it's really great because he's still connected with the two main people in that series. And one of them, um, Aaron just graduated from college. Oh, cool. Okay. I mean, I think he brought a whole nother world to them as well. And they collaborated a lot with him, unbeknownst to him at the time. Issues like suicide, which is huge in Ireland, became a part of that work. I don't think that was ever his intention, but it became part of it because it was happening. And I like the way that he handled it in the book because it's just, it's presented in a, re in a way that's really you get it. Like it's not in your face, but as you're reading the book and you're going through the book, you suddenly go, oh, something happened here. You know, and he did that by using um, a graphic novelist from Dublin who did drawings. There were drawings interspersed with the photographs. And I think the last photograph in the book is amazing because it's an argument between him and Aaron as to whether he can put this picture in the book and she didn't want it. And so what he did is he he put the argument on top of the photograph so you can see the edges of the photograph. You can't see the photograph, but you engage in their discussion, which I thought was really powerful. A lot of discussion had to go on with the development of that series. And I also had to talk with him a lot about the responsibility of, in some, in some cases, families would get split up and maybe the kids would go into care and he would be very defiant about wanting to give the kids their photographs because he would bring photographs back with him. And I'd say, you know, you can't just do that. Now, now the government's involved, so you have to go through the channels. 
And so we would work on that together, you know, and that's part of, that was part of my job, making sure he had model releases for everybody. You know, everybody was kind of like, ah, he doesn't need that. I'm like, no, we're going to get model releases for everybody because that can come back and get you. It may be that nobody ever questions it, but it only takes one to stop an entire project. So he got model releases for everybody. Um, I learned a lot of things running that art center. I mean, I brought Claudi Slubin into St. Patrick's Prison for Boys in, or for young men in Dublin. I had never really worked with an institution like that. And I learned a lot about working with an institution and they, the role that a someone like an artistic director needs to play for the artist. You have to advocate for the artist. You have to explain to the institution what this artist is doing in this space and how it benefits the institution. They just saw him as a photographer. The prison, you mean? Center for Young Men or whatever, yeah? Okay. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a prison. It was a juvenile prison. Yeah. They, at one point, the warden of the prison gave Cloudy a digital camera that he had lying about and said, now you go out now and you take a picture of the front of the prison there. We're, we're going to use that. We've got to have an idea. And Cloudy was like, I, I don't I don't use a camera like this, first of all. And secondly, this isn't my job. I mean, in the end, he did it because he was just whatever. It was really difficult for me because I had to deal with him getting extremely angry and then trying to deal with a warden who was also like, but I'm the warden. And like working with the army was another thing. Having to be the go-between between Simon Norfolk and the court capital of culture and the army. And then there was me like advocating for the artist. Like, no, he doesn't want to do that. Yes, he will, he'll do that. Yes, he'll give you this. He won't give you that, you know, and he doesn't have to. And that was really stressful at times, but it was also, I mean, it taught me a lot about, about what to do in advance to make sure you don't suddenly have to do some kind of triage on a project because someone's upset. I think that whole time, I mean, one of the things that I think I really learned working at Sirius is how little it takes to empower somebody. If you have young people who are having problems in school, who haven't found their voice yet. I mean, we brought in, actually through CO Berlin, I met with Felix Hoffman and he introduced me to their education department and they were doing a stop motion animation workshops. And I really, really loved what they were doing. And I said, can you tell me more about the people who are teaching this workshop? Turned out one of them was from Derry. And the other one was in was in Germany. So I was able to bring them to Sirius. They did a workshop with the school. They brought the kids from the school to Sirius. And as they were doing the stop motion animation, it was like a period of four days, I guess. The teachers came in at one point and they were just like completely astonished. Like I said, is everything okay? And they're like, no, you don't understand. There are kids in here that never sit still, that are complete troublemakers, and they're absolutely focused. Because they found something they understood, and they went back to their classroom, and they carried this newfound respect for themselves into the classroom. And so they were able to focus in the classroom. And that was something I was trying to build. I called the county arts officer. I called the arts council. I just said, you guys have to come and see this. This is really amazing. Or working with a home for people with Alzheimer's. It was a day center. And we brought in a multi-generational project. And the nun who was running the day center said to me at one point, there are people in here who haven't spoken for years and they're speaking again. <sighs> and that was just through the engagement with the arts. And it's so powerful. Yeah. And that was a huge thing for me. So I was constantly trying to find ways to give kids voice because there's nothing worse than being a young person and being bored and not knowing, knowing that there's something that you want to do, but you can't name it. And then suddenly you take an acting class or you sing, or in my case, you pick up a camera and it's easy. And you're like, oh, here it is. Here's this thing that I can do well. And it gives you so much more confidence and it makes you feel seen. And that to me is one of the things that art can do for people. It gives you a voice that you wouldn't, it's a language you wouldn't know about, no. you know, otherwise. But in fairness, I was trying to do too much there, really. I was, I mean, I was running the whole place. I was writing all the grants. I was fundraising for the building, running the residency program. I finally handed off the music program to somebody else. I stopped carrying chairs up these stairs. You know, I just suddenly went, okay, I've got to stop or I'm going to die. But I reached a point where I felt like I had gone as far as I could go. I was really pleased with everything I did. I was really happy that I was able to get different communities to work together. But I was tired. I mean, it sounds exhausting, the amount that you were doing. It like, was. <laughs> it's incredible. And I think looking back on it, that's something really to be proud of, to have really to brought so many people together and really have changed the community and become part of the community. I guess when you still go back to Cove, people are like, oh, Peg, come have a cup of tea. Yeah, it was hilarious this time. I mean, I have this show in the Crawford Art Gallery right now. I have in transit in the Crawford Art Gallery. Unfortunately, it's all locked up. But when I was there, I actually went back to Sirius for the first time since I left. And I left in 2015. So 
I walked in and two of my staff members were still there. Like one of them came in the kitchen and saw me and just froze and went, wait, did you just walk out five minutes ago? Or have you been gone five years? And then as I walked out of the building, I ran into somebody who used to run the tourist office in the building and she was kind of the head of the staff there. And she was just like, what? You know, like, what are you doing here? It's really nice to feel like I can go back there. And I, I also know that um, I can go back and work with someplace like the Crawford, which is a big municipal gallery in Cork City, and be able to bring a project like In Transit and be given almost carte blanche to, yeah. they know me well enough, they trust me well enough to know that I can deliver. So it's really great to be able to do that. It's great to be able to go to the cultural center in Paris, the Irish cultural center, and to bring a show like Roseanne's last year during uh, Perry Photo. We did a show there. I curated to show there and to have those connections. I mean, I have Irish citizenship now, which is fantastic. So I have an EU passport, which is so important to me. And I lived there so long and I was so deeply embedded in the community. If I walked away without having that connection, I would have been really... It would have made me really sad. So now, I mean, I feel like I still have a sort of like having a membership card, you know, <laughs> I, can, I can go in and out and, and I still feel really close to Ireland. I mean, it's funny because I got on the bus to go to court from Dublin. It's like I hadn't been gone at all. You know, I felt really connected and there's a lot of artists there that I would really like to work with that I wasn't able to when I was at Sirius. And they've actually, like, it's been really interesting to watch certain artists develop their practice even more and to be able to go back now five years later and say, well, maybe we can do something and we might even be able to do it in Doha. Yeah, so actually that's a good transition point. So you went from San Francisco to Coven Island to Dubai. I've turned my life upside down more than once, yeah. I mean, I left from 20th and Valencia in San Francisco, which is like, a pretty, I mean, that's inner city to yeah. living in Doolin, which is two streets and three pubs and a bunch of B&Bs and that's it, to Cove, which was the center where everybody left Ireland from. That was where everybody got on the boat back in the day. That's where the prison ships left from. I mean, there's huge history there. And then go to Dubai, which is again, like what? You know, like it's like turning everything on its head. I was offered the position of artistic director there when, when they had just opened the gallery. At East Wing. Yeah. I said to Ali Domit, the director at the time, I said, you know, I've never run a commercial gallery. And he said, well, I'm sure you can do it. We'll work it out. So I decided to move to Dubai and I had always intended not to stay. For, I thought I would stay three years. And then I would I would come back to Europe because I my my network is in Europe. That's where I can do my best work because I have so many connections in Europe. And also I've, I've developed some connections in the U.S. since I've been away as well. But I wanted to go and I wanted to learn who the audience was. But to be fair, it was very expensive there. And I just felt like I could do more for the gallery from Europe in terms of what I do well, which is connecting people and developing projects. So I lasted about a year. I gave them the decision whether they wanted to continue to work with me and have me move to Berlin where I can afford to live or to leave with no hard feelings. Thankfully, they agreed to let me work remotely. And about a year after I left, there was a, some political issues that caused us to close the gallery in that there was a blockade against Qatar. So we took the gallery out of Dubai and now we're deciding what to do. We kind of took a hiatus. We did, we finished our year of art fairs and then last year we didn't do anything in terms of art fairs. I was touring in transit, which is this group exhibition about immigration, which features three um, East Wing artists plus two other artists. And I brought that to America. It had first been shown in Aarhus in Denmark in 2015. Then last year, we brought it to Blue Sky Gallery, SF Camera Work in San Francisco, San Diego State University Downtown Gallery, and Lunder Art Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now it's in Cork in Ireland. And we were able to expand the show for Cork, which was really exciting for me. Last year was really, and this is something that we were kind of talking about earlier in regards to the virus and what it's causing. I mean, one thing about being in the arts and being an artistic director or being an artist is that I think there's a huge pressure on us to be seen, to be seen going to places, to, to be able to network, to be able to meet people. I mean, it's so important in the arts to be able to go and see exhibitions and learn from our colleagues how they curated something. And so last year, that's all I did was chase my tail for a year. I mean, I just went to every festival I could go to. I went to, I went to Australia. I went to Basel. I went to Arles. I was, you know, I went to as many things as I could on one hand to be able to go and say, no, okay, we don't have a physical space, but we're not gone. And also to meet the artists in traveling in transit, I was able to kind of show that 
You know, there's other ways that East Wing can be a part of the international photographic community. No, we're not doing art fairs right now, but we, you know, we're still selling work through like Artsy, but I'm also able to do something like in transit where we can partner with nonprofits and be able to bring work that maybe wouldn't be seen otherwise. Going from nonprofit to commercial, again, it was a big learning curve and I'm still learning um, how to do that. Yeah, because it sounds how you've described now, especially with last year, that you were going to so many different festivals, coming to terms with the fact that the political unrest in the Middle East had caused the physical space of the gallery to close, but it's still present in the market and it's still taking place at some different fairs, but even how you can then adapt to the new marketplace because so many galleries have been closing and galleries that have been open for 30 years were closing, even with a lot of fairs. There were a lot of fairs. There was a lot of festivals. I mean, there was a lot of photographic events around the world. I think we're going to see a lot of galleries closing because of what's happening right now with COVID-19. I mean, even talking to the Crawford regarding in transit saying like, we're not even sure if we can get back in our building until August. Yeah. You know, I mean, nobody knows. I mean, that's the thing about what's happening right now is you can't claim to know because this is the first time this has happened at this level. How is this going to affect photojournalism? How is this going to affect somebody who, well, like right now I have an artist who, um, Arco Dato, who's based in Kolkata, but right now he's stuck in France, so he can't he can't go home and he also can't make any work because how can he travel anywhere? You can't right now. I just feel like right now we're in this period of really not knowing. And I hope, I mean, it's my really deep hope that out of this is going to spring communities again, this idea of community putting on things together. I mean, that was one of the reasons I moved to Berlin in the first place was that I saw something that I hadn't seen since I lived in San Francisco, which was this, I'm working with this artist. Maybe they would be interesting to you. Is there some way that we can work together so that I can do it and you can do it and we both like I mean that was like touring in transit like at least touring in transit I could bring it to four different venues in the U.S. and they shared costs and that made it possible otherwise they wouldn't have been able to bring me out let alone the work it's really hard working in the arts as we all know because when there's a travesty like this the first thing people want is they want art and they want it for free. They want their their performers to perform on all networks as they did last week here in the U.S. They want to be able to go and see virtual exhibitions for free. They want to be able to hear artists talk for free, you know, and all of that. And, and at some point, the artist has to get paid and the venues have to be supported. And how I, I think this is something that's really going to come to a head in so many ways. Like people don't value the people working in the grocery store. But right now. They're really glad they're there and they should be rewarded for that. People know that doctors are important, but right now doctors and nurses are like on the front line. And it's the same with the arts in a way. Of course, it's different. It's not it's not that. But culture is very important to our identities. And when things suddenly stop, the first thing you want is you want your culture. You want something familiar that you can hang on to. You want to hear your favorite song. You want to see that painting or that photograph that moves you so deeply. You want to read that book. I thought it was really interesting when this first happened. A lot of people that I spoke to could only read poetry. Really? Okay. Yeah. It was like trying to read a book. It was just too hard. You know, I saw a lot of poetry being posted on social media platforms along with music. I really, I heard people really like, I'm turning to poetry right now. And I think because poetry is short, but it's also so embedded with ideas and also um, emotion. Sorry, that's the bells in the church <laughs> going on. That was good timing. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, and I think that's something that, um, that we need to consider and I, I, you know, that we need to be aware of. I mean, living in Ireland... For so long, um, we're going to get 11 bells now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, living in Ireland and, and, you know, and for the tourism board to say, you know, where else in the world can you go? I mean, let me, let me rephrase that. Anywhere you go in the world, people know who James Joyce is. Yes. People know who, you know, some of the great playwrights are. They know who U2 is. They know who some of, you know, they know who the trad musicians. They know what river dance is. I mean, you can go to Japan and people know who James Joyce is. That is a tiny little country. And to have that kind of cultural power, it's incredible. That's the value of art is that it can touch people and they don't even need to know your language. You can look at a painting and be moved. And it can be from another country where you don't understand the language, but you understand the painting in your own way. You know, I think we 
underestimate the power and the importance of our culture until there is a moment like this. Yeah. And then that's the first thing we turn to, but will we value it when we're on the other side of that? I think it's great that we're being forced to stop and think, but I also hope that we'll be able to develop our communities. I really hope so. And I think that's a good point that you make. We're so much more powerful if we work together. Honestly, I saw that in Ireland. To be able to bring someone like, you know, Lee Miller's work to the James Joyce Museum in Dublin, they would have never considered that. Or to bring All My Levin, which was a show that I did in Poland with Krzysztof Sandrowicz and Krzysztof Tanner, to be able to bring that to Cork and then use that as a way to get all the different organizations to work together in that area. That was an amazing exchange. There's so many things we can do when we work together and pool our resources. It makes it more affordable for everybody. I hope that we will do that. It's funny because when I started working for East Wing, I was still had this nonprofit head on. And so I would keep saying things like, oh, I need to find funding for that. And a friend of mine recently <laughs> said, you're not working for a nonprofit anymore. But, you know, East Wing is different in that we are a commercial gallery, but we also are very interested in education. We're also very interested in something like getting a show about migration out to make people consider what is that actually? What is migration and mm -hmm. who is involved? And to try to educate people that it could, you know, you're a hair's breadth away even now, even now more than ever, you're a hair's breadth away from being someone who has to leave their home because they are not making any money and you have to go somewhere else. Yeah. And you don't know. When I moved to Ireland, I had no idea. I mean, I knew I could go back to the US if I wanted to. I didn't know if I'd be able to go back to San Francisco. Probably not. I had no idea what I was going to do. And that free fall is, it's really scary. And I think a lot of people are going to be put in that position. I mean, if you're living in a city like San Francisco, say, where it's just astronomically expensive to live, or New York, and mm -hmm. you lose your job working in the arts, you know, where, you can't stay there. You know, you can't float in New York for three months with no money. That Nobody's going to help you. You're going to have to go somewhere else. There's going to be a lot of scrambling for positions and moving. And I think if we can do exactly what you say, if the community at large will do that now, start thinking about, oh, I heard about this grant. You should apply for yeah. this. Or I heard about a job that would be perfect for you. Those kind of things keep your ears open for people or find ways to fundraise with each other. I mean, anything. And I think we are going to be in that position globally, not just, I think everybody's going to be in that position, especially in the arts. I really hope that it becomes a bit more human where we're a bit more of a community. I mean, that's kind of what the arts have always been. It's always been a community kind of thing in that we all struggle together. The idea of being an artist and having no money has never really scared any artists. We follow our passion in the arts. We do it out of passion and love, and it's our language. We don't have a choice. Even what I do now, even though I'm not making work myself, I still feel like what I do is quite artistic in that I have to use that part of my brain. I'm looking at work in that way. Part of the reason I don't make work is because I look at so much work. It would be hard for me to make work now and not be influenced by something that I'm looking at because I'm looking at so much stuff all the time. Yeah, I think I'm the same. Because I have such high expectations of the people that I work with, I have higher ones for myself. Exactly. <laughs> and if I look at it, it's like, would I accept this if someone gave it to me? Mm, probably not. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's what makes us both very strong curators. We have that inside of us already. And we, and we know, I mean, we know what it is to be an artist. I think we know the kinds of difficulties, but also the pleasure. And we also know that click when you're doing something and, you, and suddenly it's just going. I always like to talk about William Kentridge and his idea that the studio has to be a, a safe place for stupidity. And that, you know, it's through all those false starts that you find the edge of an idea. And then you finally go, oh, okay, this is where I'm going now. I didn't really know that was the direction I was going. I thought I was going this way, but actually I'm going this way. There feels like there's a connection between that way of working where you, you're you constantly, you have to just kind of put yourself in the way of the process and let it take you to where you need to go and a situation like this where it's all so uncertain. I mean, we do yeah. have those tools in a way to deal with that kind of uncertainty because when you're making a new body of work, you may have an idea of what it what it's about and then suddenly it takes a U-turn and you're like, oh, actually, this is what it's about. That kind of intuitive way of moving through a project is going to have to come into play. Maybe that's going to be the tool that a lot of artists have to rely on to move forward. I don't think it's ever a real given for us. You know, we start a project, it's not like, I'm going to do this and it's going to be this and this and this and this. You know, it's going to be an exhibition and it's going to be that. And it's going to be a book. And it, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. But the thing mm -hmm. that we do in our profession is we go with where our work takes us.
also sometimes we create work and we go, well, that's actually not very good. Okay, let's go some, let's go try something else, you know. <laughs> but it goes back to that thing that I think I get so much from what William Kentridge says about it being a safe place for stupidity. You know, it, you need to you need to be able to have a lot of false starts. And through those false starts, you find the essence of what it is that you are trying to say, what you're trying to create. Yeah, I think I remember John Cleese said something similar when they worked with Monty Python, that they had an hour or they had like half a day every week where you could just freely play and experiment and not be afraid of doing anything wrong. And then afterwards, we'll go back and look at it and then see if there's anything here to really hang on to. And I think it's being able to accept your mistakes, but also trust the process. Yeah. And maybe the first idea that you had isn't the one that you'll ultimately end up realizing, but you needed to have that idea to make that first step to get to the next exactly. step to allow the process to take place. I remember at one point in San Francisco, I had a friend who was not an actor who took improv classes as part of his kind of therapy. And the reason that he took that is because he realized that for an improv to be successful, you have to say yes. Whatever's thrown at you, you have to say yes to. If you say no, if someone makes a suggestion in an improv and you just shoot it down, that's the end of the improv. That's it. And that's very much what life is about. And that's really how I felt when I moved to Ireland. I just said yes to everything. I said yes to life, really. When I moved to Ireland, I had to open that horizon because a lot of times things came out of left field. Getting to work with Roger Ballin came out of left field. Going to China came out of left field. I was not expecting it. Getting offered a job in Dubai, I just said yes to it. I didn't know if it was going to work. Yeah. I just thought, it sounds really interesting. I don't know anything about this. This is a great opportunity. I'm going to chance it. And I think the important thing that artists should remember right now is that we do have this intuitive connection to our process and that we need to apply it more to our life. I want to say false starts because I don't want to say mistakes. Stop seeing false starts as some kind of condemnation and instead seeing it as another piece of information. You do something, it doesn't work out. That's a piece of information. That's not something to be ashamed of. It's something to mm -hmm. learn from. I mean, the fact that I worked day jobs, I was a receptionist. I worked with files. I was a film service person. I worked in labs. I printed. I got something from all those jobs that I can apply to what I'm doing now. I definitely didn't know that at the time. Working with institutions, with artists, just feeling like I wanted to throw myself off a cliff sometime because it was so hard. I got some great skills from that that I can apply now, but I didn't know that at the time. At the time, I just thought, this is miserable. <laughs> this is really, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think if we can broaden our understanding, I mean, you know, the odds are always stacked against us as artists. It's really hard. Not all of us get to be in a position where we make loads of money. We might be really well respected, but make spit. I don't think that's why we go. I mean, most of us don't go into the arts to make money. We go into the arts because we don't have another choice. Yeah. It's what we want to do. If we can't, make money in our chosen field, if we can't make money as an artist per se, then maybe we'll become a framer and we'll do our artwork on the side or we'll become an artistic director and be able to work mm -hmm. with artists in a way that feeds our soul and our spirit because we weren't able to make the money with our own practice. But use those tools and feel confident or not confident, uh, feel rewarded or satisfied that we can be creative and maybe not in the way we thought of them. Yeah, and also to be part of a community and to contribute to something. Oh my God, I feel so fortunate to know the people that I know and to be able to, I mean, we had a meeting this week on Zoom with 14 curators from as far away as Tel Aviv. Two people were in San Diego, one was in Chicago, one was in Houston, London, Italy, France. Switzerland, Cambridge, it was incredible to be able wow. to look at, on that screen. And all we did in that first meeting was just go, how are you? And we each talked for five or 10 minutes just saying, okay, here's what it, what's going on here. And to have that community, just to be able to see each other. I mean, I was at PhotoFest before I came here, landing in Houston and then immediately starting to see colleagues from London and all these other places going, should we be here? I wonder if we should be here. Yeah. And then within 24 hours, all the colleagues from Germany were getting on planes going back. And I had to make this decision. Am I going to go back to Berlin or am I going to go be with family? Mm -hmm. I just think that moment of having us all together in Houston is what really sustained me in the beginning because I got to see people I really care about who are yeah. my trusted colleagues and my friends and kind of my extended family. And to be able to be there for the people in Houston and say, look, we're going to still do portfolio reviews online. And I've been doing that as much as I can to try to support Houston because mm -hmm. PhotoFest is very important. And the things that PhotoFest has given me 
I'm extremely grateful for. I've met, I mean, I've met Doug Dubois at PhotoFest. I met Gilles Perron, who I'd worked with for four years at PhotoFest. I've met Felix Hoffman at PhotoFest. A lot of contacts I made come from those points where we meet each other. And I think there was this fear when we were all leaving that, when are we going to be able to do this again? Yeah, absolutely. Because as curators, publishers, and artists, we need that community. We need to be able to see each other. We need to be able to talk. And I mean, Zoom is great or Skype or whatever platform you're using, but it's not the same as being in the same space. And you can't just run into somebody on Zoom. No. <laughs> it's not like you go to a festival and you meet someone and it's like, oh, you should know this person because they're also here with me. And then you make new connections. All of that has stopped. You know, in PhotoFest and also other organizations that meet every so often, a lot of the best meetings are on the bus. You know, you're yeah. sitting on a bus going somewhere and you sit next to somebody you don't know and you introduce yourself and you start having a conversation. The next thing you know, you're doing a project together. That doesn't happen on Zoom. That's not going to happen on Skype. There, there's a group of, I think we're seven women in total. And we started meeting two years ago. We've called ourselves the Farmanistas because it started in Farnham. <laughs> And we just met to see how we could support women in our fields, not just photographers, but young women starting out as artistic directors, curators. We're trying to think of as from our little brain pool, how could we support each other mm -hmm. and, and how could we support other people? Because we've all been through issues as women working in nonprofit organizations or having bosses who were bullies or different aspects. I mean, some of the women had, had kids and some, some of the women lost their partners. And, you know, how did we get through that? And how can we bring our experience to somebody else? We now meet once a week just to keep our sanity. And it's the oh, most, nice, yeah. I mean, it's the best hour and a half of the week because we just, you know, like there's the first maybe 20 minutes of going, how are you? How are you? How are you? And then we go, okay, let's talk about this. Like this week we were talking a lot about all this online content and is it effective or how can we make it more effective? And I mean, what I would do would be different from what someone at a major museum would do or someone in Italy would do or, but it's really interesting to get all those points of view, but also it's that community being able to meet yeah. them once a week and know that's going to happen or to have that enormous meeting we had this week where we just were like, everybody was just so happy to see each other and have this conversation. I mean, <laughs> we didn't even start to touch on subjects yet. It was just to see each other. But again, it's that idea of community and that you have shared history with these people, whether it's through mm -hmm. your profession or through college or because you shot punk rock shows when you were 17 those relationships are really important. I hope you enjoyed listening to Peg's story and her advice for artists. In the show notes, I've provided links to each of the topics we spoke about. If you'd like to hear more from her, Peg will be presenting live on the 20th of June as part of Creative Conversations Digital from Glass Tire in Texas. It will be a live online webinar complete with a QA. and I've provided a link in the description how you can also find it on the events page of the Glass Tire website. Please subscribe to stay up to date with the latest episodes. You can find subtext and discourse on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the usual streaming platforms. As always, I welcome any comments and feedback to this and previous episodes. Thanks again for tuning in. New episodes are released every second Monday. Until then, stay healthy and take care. My name is Michael Dooney, and you've been listening to Subtext and Discourse.